Thanks, Tracy. I'm going to put your microphone on. Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session. A very special guest came all the way from Oakland today. Uh, we're waiting to pull out. Uh, Tracy Richmond McKnight. McKenzie? McKnight. McKnight. I had it right the first time. Sorry. I was talking about TRGP in the post proposition 5664. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, good. Okay. Um, right here? Right here. Yeah. So um, I sent my my bio too late to get in the packet, so I'm just going to take 30 seconds to tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, my background is in um, bioengineering and um, radiology, basically bioengineering and physics, I guess you would say. I was on the faculty of UCSF for 15 years in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging, where I did uh, brain imaging for cancer. So, and um, transition to I wanted to learn more about science policy and science for the public. So I transitioned to the office of the UC office of the president and started working for TRDRP, which many of you know about, but I want to tell you a little more about TRDRP. Can you hear me? No, we're gonna let it if you turn it off. Okay, is that is is that better? Did, did everyone hear did you hear what I said? That's what I need. Research. That's our 
you know, public health, education, and, and research. So we get about 5% of every dollar um, to go toward tobacco research. Um, we have a broad portfolio. This actually shows our um, grant priority areas, our funding priority areas between uh, 2010 and 2015. They have changed a little in the past couple of years. But we fund everything from disparities research, prevention, cessation, nicotine dependence is actually its own area right now. That's the portfolio that I oversee. Um, where it says early diagnosis and pathogenesis, that's actually primarily for cancer and cardiovascular research. But we've kind of thrown a lot of biomedical research under that area. And we focus on early detection and pathogenesis in the past as an efficiency measure because um, we didn't have a lot of funds to give out and so we couldn't fund all of the basic research that's out there. We also um, put a lot of money into, into exposure and toxicology. Third Hand Smoke, the Third Hand Smoke Initiative um, was basically originated with the TRGRP funding and it's now informing a lot of policy within the uh, state and the, and the nation. Um, we fund a lot of research on uh, tobacco industry influence and policy and regulatory science, um, some, some on new products, but we're going to do more with new products. So as I said, our goal is to um, inform the uh, policy uh, within California to, to, to improve the health of all Californians. And there were questions earlier to talk about how you know, what is the best way to get the information to the public? And a theme that you're going to get sick of hearing me talk about is the need for scientists to learn how to speak to the public. And we um, do, we are pushing that initiative um, in many, many ways. I want to talk about it in a lot of ways in this talk. Um, this is an example. Um, I chose to start with Nick, with something from our nicotine dependence panel from one of our, one of our nicotine grantees, longtime grantees and a, a, a pioneer in the area of nicotine dependence use, Dr. Leslie at uh, Irvine. And one of her students came up, I mean, well, she, they wrote this paper a couple of years back. Uh, it, it was a, extremely timely because people were beginning to talk about a tobacco tax. And it's a very important point, some of which have been known in the field for quite some time, some of which are new, that the adolescent brain is uniquely sensitive to nicotine, um, acute exposure, impact brain development, we've been hearing that. Um, chronic exposure results in persistent changes, and the responses in, in kids are different than we see in adults. And it even argues that um, uh, nicotine exposure um, may introduce changes that sensitize the brain and other drugs and prime it for a future substance abuse. So as I said, it is not, you know, most of you guys know this, have heard this, but the legislature doesn't know it. And, and quite frankly, the legislature is not going to pick up this paper out of journal, even if you put it on their desk, um, they're not going to do it. Even the physicians on the legislature, uh, Dr. Pan, may not read it. So having nice graphics like this, where you clearly we're talking about adults versus um, uh, Adolescents, and that there's something that has to do with nicotine, and there's something about symptoms and, and withdrawal. It makes it much easier for uh, to to get across to the public, to the community, and definitely to the legislature to impact policy. So I took a lot of time with that one, but um, that's just showing how we're trying to get our investigators to um, make their results more amenable to the public, to public consumption. Um, now, um, a big plug for TRDRP, we are part of the Com California Comprehensive Tobacco Control Program. <clears throat> this is work from Don Pierce, another one of our longtime grantees down in San Diego. He is a health economist. And, um, you know, some of the initial studies that he and Karen Messer have done um, show that with the start of this tobacco program, this a historic program, there was a reduction in the initiation of smoking among teens. Compared to the rest of the U.S., there was a quickening in the decline of both per capita uh, cigarette consumption and prevalence for, for heavier smoking. This is just with funding, and this is just, just with Prop 99 in the beginning of the program. 
maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, between 1960 um, and, tw and 2012, differences um, in per capita cigarette consumption between California and the rest of the U.S. was mostly explained by the difference in cigarette taxes and difference in tobacco control expenditures. So if you put your money where your mouth is, you will get results. Um, and that difference in, consum in consumption was directly correlated with um, a difference, in, a drop in lung cancer rate within California, a quicker drop compared to the rest of the U.S. So this is the data we have to get quickly to the legislature. You increase the price, you better increase the cost of getting the drug, and you, uh, which in this case is, is nicotine, you will directly impact the health of, uh, of the people with, of, of your, of your constituents. Um, California has one of the lower taxes in the country. The weight compared to other states, they didn't have the lower, one of the lowest rates imposed. This is, uh, okay, so this is saying that between 1960 and 2002, during that time period, so, at 19, so when the tax came in, it was not one of the lower ones in, initially. And so that is the drop. So, so now that's true. Um, but, and so that initial decline was so steep that you're right, as our tax rate started to compare or be worth the rest of the nation, we did have a leveling off, but it was still lower, so it ended up being lower than the rest of the nation. Right, but it's a steep drop. The point is that um, we had a steep early drop because we actually did something about it. Right. Another thing that we did, actually, this was a press conference that we did down here in, in LA. Um, Wendy mentioned we did um, cost of smoking in California. Again, a nice big pie chart that shows you it was an 18 uh, total of the 18 billion dollar cost in healthcare costs directly related to um, cigarette use. Most of it are direct healthcare costs of people having to go to the hospital. Um, other indirect costs from premature death, so you you know you no longer have people in the workforce, you know, um, and so the you know families don't have a, a, um, one of their income people bring income into the house, and then indirect costs due to illness and people being out of work that way. Um, again, notice that the cost of smoking exceeds the tax revenue. This was again, this was in 2014 that this came out. Um, for every dollar that we get tax revenue, the cost of smoking the cost of smoking is twenty one dollars was. And she, uh, she also predicted but she also predicted that hey, if we increase the cig the cigarette tax by two dollars, which which at that time was being discussed, there wasn't a proposition yet. Um, we could uh, so the top shows the uh, percent. Uh, um, I'm sorry. The percent prevalent in California, which is very low, 10 percent. But um, if, if we stayed the way we were, it would go to 9.3 percent. But if we if, if implemented the tax, it could drop. We would have there again that very early drop, um, and we could end up at 6.9 percent um, over the same period of time, just four years. Um, and if you would get a commensurate increase in savings, you know, 3.3 billion dollars in savings over that same period of time. So all of this, again, very nice, clean graph, money, impact on the state. We were a, we did show that data, I'm just going to say, we did show all of the data to the TROC, which is a, uh, which is a governing body. They have to write reports to the legislature. Um, I even showed the Francis Leslie data to TROC, um, and they were able to get um, messages across as well to all of the voluntaries, actually. We were able to get messages across that, hey, increasing the tax would be a good thing. Uh, we're not allowed to actually say that. I guess I can say it now. <laughs> but we're not allowed to act. We can say this is what our researchers find. Um, and so we were allowed to make it um, public. So yay, one great thing that happened. And the 
the last election was the cash of the Department of State. Um, I won't take all of the credit, but I know that you need evidence, uh, you know, in order to support these claims. Uh, it increased the tax by two by two dollars and expanded what that money would be used for. The, the the research part of that money would be used for. Now, at the same time, oh no, I should say expanded what that money would be used for. So, just to give you an idea of what that means for TRGRP, it's really incredible. You never hear this kind of thing. So, um, and this is, the, this is the total dollars that we have to spend this year. This is this year, so we will give this out in, the, in January and in July, through July 1st of 2018. We um, will give out nine times the amount of funding we have, that we gave out last year. Um, yeah, actually, I actually to say that a little more correctly, nine times, which is it's still true, but nine times the amount of money that we get solely from Prop 99. So we still get Prop 99 dollars, but we also get Prop 56 dollars. So we would, um, so and even over, even taking into account the drop um, in revenue that we'll get as people begin to smoke less and smoke cigarettes and, and maybe shift to e-cigarettes, and we don't know what that taxation is going to be like yet. Um, even Taking all of that into account, we still expect to get about, have about seven times the amount that we've previously been able to give out. So give us grants, give us applications, really. That's what this is for. Trainees become faculty. <laughs> so now, there was also a passage of Prop 64. Now, we didn't um, take a stand on that either way. Um, so what's it got to do with it? You know, what, what, what cannabis got to do with it? What does it have to do with, with tobacco? Um, well, you know, if you look at the premise of, of this, you know, TRDRP loves kids, and you know, the impact on kids is always an issue. So, looking at the, what I want to point out about this graph, here is uh, here's the exclusive. Um, the solid line is the exclusive. Mar the exclusive Cigarette use, which is going, which has been going down among high schoolers, um, this is exclusive mar marijuana use, which is overtaking. Um, those are the two lines that I want you to focus on. That's a big reason for us to even care about it, because if we we're still talking about smoking a substance. Um, I um, as I am going to shamelessly use um, a, more of my, a, more of our grantee slides. Uh, these couple of them put together is a nice set of slides when we had a, a, a research, a she's from San Francisco and she looked at the risk of um, mar marijuana products and tobacco products, um, the, uh, the perceptions around those and presented it to us as we were trying to decide if we would take, make a foray into cannabis research. And um, just a few slides from her presentation, well we have to care about it because very often they're used together either in the same device, um, both types of leaves roll together, or they're co-vaped. Either the same device is used to vape nic uh, nicotine liquid or to vape marijuana liquid or marijuana substance of some kind, of some kind or sometimes they're used to, I think sometimes they're used together, but definitely the same devices are. Um, and as I said about third-hand smoke and, and, and resins, you still are still the same chemical constituents. Um, secondhand cannabis smoke. Um, we know that secondhand, the whole secondhand smoke we heard earlier about how that which is really what made the um, made California the message, made California the first state in the nation to ban the public use of um, cigarettes. So we have to think about um, secondhand uh, cannabis smoke. This is actually from a Craigslist ad in the Modesto as in California. So this is not Colorado. <laughs> But um, advertising a, a, a cannabis friend, friendly bedroom studio, but you, but you can't smoke cigarettes. But you know you can definitely you just know that I smoke. You know the owner smokes, and we're all going to. But you know we're going to smoke mar marijuana, but you can't smoke cigarettes. So this is kind of the perception that secondhand is right. See, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, none of those bad guys, but we're going to. You know, but I definitely. 
marijuana. Um, we know that um, secondhand smoke uh, substantially impair, impairs blood vessel function. Again, one, this is another one of our grantees. This is all evidence-based work. Um, neither THC nor the paper smoke are required for that uh, blood vessel in, um, in impairment. Um, and nor is nicotine required for that impairment. And one, one minute of marijuana smoke exposure impairs the blood vessel function for at least 90 minutes, much longer than cigarettes. Uh, Matt Springer, uh, again, up in uh, San, Francisco, San Francisco. And smoke is smoke. Hemp has many of the same harmful, harmful constituents as tobacco. It may have more or less of, of some of them, but they have, the, they have the same one. It's something that we need to think about as a smoked, combusted, inhaled, and exhaled substance. Um, so again, I just put this back up here to say, so we, it's our responsibility to inform, uh, to, pre, to produce research that informs policy. So we decided that cannabis is within our mandate. We do not receive Prop 64 funds. I don't want as many things like we do, but we are accepting um, research applications on uh, cannabis under this new um, mandate. So I wrote this in bold because we have also been given the a challenge of expanding our research into the this very vague, <laughs> very vague um, description into the causes. I mean, it's not vague. It's like just do some health research is really what they said. Um, so we, we are getting to look at causes, early detection, and effective treatment, care, prevention, and potential cure of all types of cancer, cardiovascular and lung diseases, oral disease, and tobacco-related diseases. So it's basically the health of California. I mean, it was, we have a very broad portfolio now. I'm going to quickly, I don't have two minutes, huh? Two minutes. Um, but I'm going to quickly go through some of the main changes. I encourage all of you to, in any, any nonprofit, anyone that works at a nonprofit institution in this room that needs funds, I encourage you to go to our website and see what our, um, get more information on the funds that are available. Um, so we are, are still focusing, we are still prioritizing tobacco related research, but we gotta say we're accepting cannabis um, as well as a lot of other topics. Um, we have two funding cycles this year, which are different. Um, we have already uh, closed the LOI date for the first cycle, and applications are due next week, or September 25th, in about 10 days. Um, and those will be reviewed in December. Then we have another cycle where LOIs are opening in December. They are, you have to get your LOI in by January, something like that. And they'll be due, the applications will be due February 28th to be funded July 1. So we have two this year, same, um, same priorities. Um, we have expanded, we've, pulled, we've included cerebral vascular diseases, which is like stroke. Um, cancer has opened up beyond early detection now. You can look at prevention and treatment. We have a new oral diseases and dental health um, one. We always emphasize health disparities throughout all of our priorities. So you don't, it does not have to be a health disparity driven project, but we encourage them no matter what, whether it's cancer or um, pulmonary biology or whatever. Um, now, the expectations are for community engagement and community participation integrated into all award mechanisms and we are innovation. This goes to, this is our push to get people to be creative to think about how to outreach to the public. We always hear from basic scientists, well, what can we do? We're looking at this mechanism for a, you know, cancer initiation. The public doesn't want to know about that. Yes, they do. One of our um, grantees, one of our young folks grantees just had fourth graders in her, in her lab um, extracting DNA from strawberries. Okay, that community engagement, it doesn't have to do with tobacco, it doesn't have to do specifically with her project, but that's getting people to think about, a segment of the population to think about research and their health in a way that they hadn't before. Fourth graders generally don't. Um, this detail of information is on the website, our grant type. 
The award levels and durations have been increased. We have new supplements this year for training students that um, I think we're going to be able to give out reach very soon. <laughs> and um, again, emphasis on community engagement. Um, this can, you can get some examples on our website. I think that's it. Yep. Time for questions? Um, you talked about the, the encouragement of the disparities related to search, and I wanted to have any benchmarks related to that. In other words, I mean, it just kind of that, that desire is put out there, but it's not necessarily evidence of internal benchmark. You can see that the portfolio, how the portfolio moves. So there, so there are two ways. So, um, oh, I still have time. <laughs> um, so we have a dedicated disparity uh, priority, that, and it, it ends up being its own study section, and that's headed by Norval Hickman, who is, has extensive research, who's done research himself in disparities, and he's very good at the benchmarks that you are talking about, and not just throwing in a couple of questions about who was your mother or something like that. So um, if you come in and this disparity is the main um, goal of your project, it will go into that study section, very strong benchmark. For the other ones, we're just asking people to consider if you're in the Los Angeles area, for